today I shall be talking about salvation in Christ. Some years ago, I was travelling by railway train, dangerous place to be, and a man came and sat opposite me. After staring at me for some time, he said to me in a low but clear voice, Are you saved? How did I reply? How would you reply to that question? I won't tell you at this moment what my reply was, but I may tell you at the end of my talk. My subject tonight, then, is salvation in Christ. If we look in the New Testament, what we find is not a single way of understanding the saving work of Christ, not a single systematic theory, but we have a whole series of images and symbols set side by side. They are symbols of profound meaning and power, yet for the most part they are not explained but left to speak for themselves. If we want to understand the work of Christ, it is better to follow what the New Testament does and to have a number of different images in our mind. We should not isolate any single image of Christ's work, but we should combine them together. Our best motto is safety in numbers. This evening, we shall look together at six possible models of salvation. This list is not exhaustive. It would certainly be possible to add other models as well. We should not see these models as alternatives, but should work with all of them, for each one reveals part of the truth to us. This leads me to recall the first time that I travelled to America half a century ago as a student in 1959. In those days you had to be very rich to go by air, and so I went by boat on one of the Cunard liners, the Queen Elizabeth. The journey lasted five days, and the ticket included not just the sleeping accommodation, but also the meals. To my immense satisfaction, I found that at mealtimes the menu was not divided up into a limited number of courses. You were given a huge card mentioning all kinds of things that you might eat, and you would have as many courses as you liked. At breakfast, for example, you could have both porridge and fruit juice and cereal, and then both smoked haddock and bacon and eggs, if you felt like that, in the heaving waters of the mid-Atlantic. In the evening, the people at my table were very unimaginative and just had three courses, soup, meat or fish, and then pudding. I worked out at least seven courses that I could have, melon, then the hors d'oeuvre, then soup, fish, meat cheese, the sweet, and perhaps one or two other things as well. I can remember walking up and down on deck each afternoon for over an hour in order to get up a good appetite for the evening. This Cunard system of feeding was excellent for me as a hungry student, wanting to get my money's worth for my ticket. Let's apply the system of the Cunard menu to tonight's topic and include in our spiritual meal all the different items on the menu of salvation. Of our six models, let us not say either or, but both and. Underlying all six models there is one fundamental truth. Jesus Christ, as our Saviour, has done something for us that we could not do alone and by ourselves. 
We cannot save ourselves. We need help. As our Lord affirms, Apart from me you can do nothing. John 15.5 In one of my favourite books, The Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M. R. James, the author recounts in a school story how the boys in class were being taught to write conditional sentences in Latin. That is, sentences beginning with the word if, expressing a future consequence. The master told them each to write down a conditional sentence of their own invention. The boys handed in their bits of paper, and the master looked at the top one. At once he made an odd noise in his throat and rushed out of the room. The boys wondered who had made a grammatical error so awful as to upset the master in this alarming way. The bit of paper on top read, Si tu non veneris ad me, ego veniam ad te. If you don't come to me, I'll come to you. And strangely, the handwriting was not that of any of the boys in the room. How the story continues, what it was that the schoolmaster so greatly dreaded, and how it eventually came to him, I shall not tell you. You must read the story for yourselves, and I do not want to spoil it for you. Let us simply apply the words on the bit of paper to the work of Christ. We could not come to God, so he has come to us. We could not by our own efforts cross over the abyss which sin has created between us and heaven. So God in Christ has crossed over the abyss and drawn near to us. In regard to each model of salvation, let us ask four questions. One, does the model in question envisage a change in God or in us. Some theories on Christ's saving work seem to suggest that God is angry with us, and what Christ has done is to satisfy God's anger. But that cannot be right. It is we who need changing, not God. As St. Paul said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. It is the world that needs to be reconciled to God, not God who needs to be reconciled to the world. Question 2. Does the model separate Christ from the Father? Some theories seem to suggest that God the Father is punishing Christ when he dies on the cross. I remember as a student in Oxford hearing that great evangelical preacher Billy Graham say, At the moment when Christ died on the cross, the lightning of God's wrath hit him instead of you. I didn't find that a very happy way of thinking of Christ's work. Surely we should not separate Christ from the Father in that kind of way, for they are one God, members together of the Holy Trinity. As St Paul states, in the words that I quoted just now, God was in Christ. When Christ saves us, it is God who is at work in him. There is no separation. Question three. 
does the model isolate the cross from the incarnation and the resurrection? We are to think of Christ's life as a single unity. So we should not think only of the cross, but we should think of what went before the crucifixion and of what comes after. Question four. Does the model presuppose an objective or a subjective understanding of Christ's work? Does Christ's saving work merely appeal to our feelings, or did he do something to alter our objective situation in an actual and realistic way? Now then, let's come to the first of my six models. And uh, this model is of Christ as teacher. We may think of him then as teacher, as the one who reveals the truth to us, who brings us light and disperses the darkness of ignorance from our minds. As it says in John 1, 9, He was the true light that enlightens everyone coming into the world. He saves us by teaching us the truth about God. This was exactly the way in which his disciples thought of him at the beginning, when they called him rabbi, which means teacher. Later, of course, they realised he was not just a human teacher, but something far more. This first model was adopted in particular by the group of second-century writers known as the Apologists, the most famous of whom was Justin Martyr. With regard to our four questions, we can say of this first model, one, yes, the change is in us, not God. Two, no, there is no separation between Jesus and the Father. Christ's teaching is the teaching of God. Three. No, the cross is not isolated. Christ's teaching role embraces his whole life, all that he said and all that he did and was. So far, so good. But difficulties arise over the fourth question. Christ opens our minds by his teaching, but does he then leave us to carry out his teaching simply by our own efforts? Has he actually changed our objective situation? More specifically, we do not merely need to be instructed, but we need to be saved from sin. So this first model embraces part of the truth, but not the whole, for it leaves out the tragedy and the anguish of sin. Then we come to the second model, ransom. In this second image of Christ and his work, we may think of him as paying a ransom on our behalf. As is said in Mark 10.45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The point of this metaphor is that previously we were enslaved to sin, but now we are liberated. Christ has set us free, Paul says in Galatians 5.1. But this act of liberation on Christ's part is enormously costly. The ransom that Christ pays on our behalf is nothing less than his own life laid down for us on the cross. It was no easy task to set us free, an act of 
arduous reparation was required. Let us remember that this is only an image or metaphor, not a systematic theory. And let us therefore not attempt to press the metaphor too far. It is wise not to ask, to whom is the ransom paid? In fact, the New Testament does not actually ask that question. If we say the ransom is paid to God the Father, then we are in danger of separating Christ from his Father and of thinking of the Father as angry and vindictive and demanding payment. Surely God is not like that. He does not require payment, but forgives us freely. Should we then say that the payment is paid to the devil? That's an answer that the fathers, Greek and Latin, have often given, but it creates major problems. It seems to suggest that the devil has rights or claims upon us, and that cannot be true. The devil has no rights. He is a liar. The essential point of the ransom metaphor is not transaction or bargain, but liberation. It is better not to ask who is being paid, but to stick to the basic point, Christ has set us free. Applying our four questions to the ransom model, we can respond. Question one, no problem. The change is in us, not God. Question two, again, no problem so long as we do not think of Christ as paying the ransom to the Father. But if we do apply the ransom metaphor in that way, then there will indeed be a danger of separating the two. Question three. Certainly the ransom model concentrates mainly on the cross but it need not do so exclusively. It is the whole life of Christ, from his incarnation to his ascension, and including the transfiguration and the resurrection, that has set us free. Question four. Here lies the major strength of the second model compared with the first. In setting us free, Christ has indeed altered our objective situation. And now model three, sacrifice. Here we enter deep waters. For us today, the idea of sacrifice has lost much of its meaning. But in the worship of the peoples of the ancient world, whether Hebrew, Greek or Roman, sacrifice was everywhere taken for granted. In the Old Testament there are many different kinds of sacrifice, yet nowhere do we find a definition of what sacrifice is and how it works. In the New Testament, Christ is seen as fulfilling the sacrifices of the Old Covenant, more especially in two ways. One, Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29 Here, Christ is seen as the Paschal Lamb, eaten by the Jews, at the Passover, in memory of the exodus from Egypt. And here you can read chapter 12 of Exodus. 
Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection is the new Passover. Then there is a second way in which the idea of sacrifice is applied to the work of Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 1 John 2, 2. The Greek word here is hilasmos, which we translate as atoning sacrifice. This recalls the sacrificial ritual on the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when the people were sprinkled with blood to cleanse them from their sins. Read Leviticus chapter 16, verses 23 and 27 to 32. In a similar way, the blood of Jesus, sacrificed for us, cleanses us from all sin. See 1 John 1 verse 7. The sacrifice on the Day of Atonement is recalled in particular when our Lord institutes the Eucharist, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew twenty six twenty eight. To understand the meaning of sacrifice, let us hold fast to four ideas. A. A sacrifice is fundamentally an offering or gift made to God. B. The true sacrifice is to offer to God not an act.